so many interesting elements to discussing peacekeeping in its various forms. And I think it's very important, first of all, to just to give an overview very briefly that not all peacekeeping missions are the same. They are made up of different components and they have different mandates, self-evidently the mandates coming from the Security Council. And all great intentions, all of them, you know, nobody wants to have an ongoing conflict. So the idea of having a peacekeeping force is to try and keep a peace. Problem number one, there often isn't a peace to keep. There are still warring factions which somehow inserting a group of people from other countries wearing, wearing uniforms, carrying guns, is seen to be one of the answers. But that's not the only model. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the differences of approaches that have been by looking at the Bosnia model, and because that's where I have most experience, um, to see how and in what way peacekeeping can embed itself within communities and fundamentally change the way in the future of that country in terms of its need for peace can then be influenced by the very presence of those peacekeepers and often in a very negative way. So just going back to the, the beginning of, the, of what I was saying is that you can have a peacekeeping force, which is very much a militarized one, which is essentially um, men, usually men, with weaponry who go into other countries and then they have to try and protect civilians to try and ensure that the warring factions are cut apart whilst um, mediation or other um, peacekeeping attempts are made. And as I say, that sounds very excellent as an idea, but it's coming from a very old school way of thinking. We then have the Bosnia type model where there was a peace agreement and then power was given through that peace agreement to various elements of the United Nations, including the Department of Peacekeeping Operations and then that enabled part of peacekeeping operations to be a militarized police force, which was essentially there to train the existing police forces. So at any one time, at the beginning of the transition from war to peace in Bosnia, there were more than 60,000 men in Bosnia from goodness knows how many different countries wearing different types of uniforms, some military, some police, all of them able to have freedom of movement within a country where nobody else did. Um, and ostensibly having mandates which gave a considerable amount of power to those who were in Bosnia um, effecting those mandates. Now, you'd say, well, what's the problem with that? Um, number one, when you've had a conflict, too much of it, most of it, nearly all of it, is about power. Who's got it, how they use it, what they use it for, and how they want to subjugate the other parts of the population. If then what you do is you send in yet another set of power holders into that situation, you are creating another set of blockages, if you like, as to who can actually exist and enjoy freedoms underneath that. You're creating, if you like, something against which the domicile population is going to feel at least some antipathy towards. And I have to say, in Bosnia, the number of, of women particularly I spoke to who said, when I first got there, um, they were conflicted because part of them wanted to see an armed convoy going past because they knew that that was going to keep them safe from any possible you know, the, the possibility of the continuation of the conflict from which they had suffered enormously. But at the same time, it was a convoy of militarized soldiers, soldiers who in a, in a militarized setting, which did two things. One, obviously, it doesn't make you feel safe if it's been the source of your persecution previously. But the other thing it does, it causes a disequilibrium within the society itself because the men who are in the domicile population are unhappy about having another bunch of men coming in and exerting more power than they do. So you end up with this power situation between competing maleness and masculinity, if you like, which then does not help to, if you like, calm the situations down. So it's got a sort of a, a social, cultural, gender dimension, which is out with the actual economy and political and politics of the actual uh, spaces they're trying to create. So that's one. And then you had in situations like Bosnia, and then we could go on and make a list of every single peacekeeping operation you have ever seen, and that is none of them have avoided sexual exploitation abuse. 
uh, Bosnia was particularly pernicious because it was not only sexualized violence, but it was trafficking for the specific purpose of sexual violence, aided, abetted, and facilitated by UN peacekeepers. Um, it's well documented. I think anybody who's been involved in looking at peacekeeping knows of what happened in Bosnia. Um, it was actually not Bosnians who were trafficked in the first place. It was women from Moldova, Romania, and Ukraine who were brought in specifically to provide the goods, horrifically so-called, for a potential market, which then became a real market as we had all these, these male peacekeepers, so-called, um, in Bosnia. That in and of itself led to massive distortion in the local economies because by and large, just about every village had some pool or a cafe, a, a bar where women were being held, yeah, often uh, even, even as basic as, as um, petrol station, um, where women were being held and where predominantly peacekeepers to start off with because nobody else had freedom of would could go and, uh, and use those women. And entire communities became dependent on the revenues for, from that activity. So you'd have the local guys who would work in the, as, as doormen. You'd have the local guys, taxi drivers. They would go pick up the girls and bring them. So it was a whole industry, which is entirely in the black economy, entirely illegal, entirely unpoliced, of course, which then led to the creation of this black economy in Bosnia, which is still alive and kicking. So it actually led to this incredible economic distortion now, we could go on for ages explaining how that then has ramifications for the future economy of a country which is post-conflict. But clearly, it's, it, it's very negative. Add in the fact that the, you know, essentially then the reputational risk to the United Nations of what it was doing was so, he, so potentially desperate that there was a massive rush to shut it all down. Any, any discussion of it, any evidence about it, anybody who was found to have done it was carefully just shoveled off to another mission somewhere else. Enter, stay right. The pro one of the other problems, this lack of accountability means that people who have are suspected of having committed offences or even found of committing offences will then be moved to, could easily be moved to another mission. And that happened on, on several occasions. Um, and as a result, what you're doing is you're pushing the same problems to another country. And... You've only got to look at what happened in DRC and then afterwards um, in Liberia when the people who'd been in Bosnia went down to Liberia and the same situation started arising. Nothing is done. No, no, if there's no accountability, then you have a repetition. If you have a repetition, you have the same problems resulting and we are not addressing then the economic distortion, the political distortion, the gendered dimensions of all of that. So we need to look first of all at the principle behind peacekeeping. Yes, no, but we said, what about then if we then paid attention to the worst consequences of it, which is what I just outlined, outlined. But of course, it's not just that because there's other activities that happen. There's the, you know, when you're collecting the weapons, what do you do with them? You can sell them back and make a lot of money off of doing that. Um, you can do illegal CDs as in back in the old days. There's a, the tobacco, there's a, you know, you can get things if you're a part of the UN mission that you can't get to if you're in the South population, which you can make an awful lot of money passing those on. So, you know, there's a lot of the economic distortion is not just about sexual exploitation, it's about the whole realm of activities, including the very innocent one, that when the UN go into a country, rents go up. And because the UN will pay much higher market rates than the domicile population could possibly afford. So then you get economic distortion between the places where and the localities where the UN people are staying compared to the rest of the country. So you then get this disequilibrium in the country itself. So there's a lot of those economic consequences which are not part of the planning, but do have a huge impact. And going forward to any sort of peaceful resolution, sustainable peaceful resolution, it mitigates against it. And then think of the actual cost of the mission itself. I mean, Bosnia was over 128 million per year just for the police alone. So it's 128 million spent in order to train the local police how to do human rights and to do their policing better. Well, they'd been policed before the war. It didn't mean that they didn't know because there's a war, they didn't know how to do policing. 
So they and, and they themselves said if they just take us out of the country, they could put us into you know take us all to Hungary. Yeah, you know, serve Christ, Bosnia together. We would have got drunk, we'd have had fights, we'd have sang songs together, but we would have bonded. We would have do better. It would have been much, much more productive than being trained by other people from other places who don't know so much about the human rights of protection of civilian, of protection of prisoners, and and being trained by them on what we should be doing. We should have been training them. I digress, but basically there is a problem with that model. It's too expensive. It puts the money back into the wrong places. So if you look at, I'm not even sure what the budget for DRC was, but I, I think it's it, well, it's in excess of uh, Bosnia because of the, the size of the force that's there. Um, and what has happened there in terms of sexual exploitation and rape is lesion. I mean, it's known everywhere just how bad that has been. Um, we did some work well, for many, many years with, with women from DRC. We have a section in DRC. And there is no place which is has not been affected by the sexual violence of the peacekeepers. And one of them said, one group said, if you're very lucky and you have a good contingent next to you, then you may get a bit of protection. If you don't, then you need protection. And that's how it worked. Um, and again, no accountability. And one of the reasons, I just want to talk a little about accountability, one of the reasons there is none is because of the insistence that it's the troop contributing countries who have to take responsibility for the accountability and prosecution of crimes which are committed by their countrymen in those countries. And it doesn't happen. They don't even have to report to the UN. So the UN should actually be very clear and say, if there are allegations and if you do not report, you do not send troops to peacekeeping. And one of the reasons I think that's important to say is because so many countries get a lot of money from the UN. It's a big money and it's part of the GDP of many of these countries that they are able to send peacekeepers and so they don't want to not be able to send. So it's not just please, please give us, our, give us your troops to go be peacekeepers. It's more, you know, we can control this. You don't get to send if you don't ensure that your own people are not committing crimes in somebody else's country and having no accountability for it. And there are ways and means in which that could be done, but probably not for this 15 minute segue. But on the costs, this is, I think, where I come to my much more important point. If we're saying, is that, well, I am asserting that it's structural. You can't have a conflict which is militarized always and which has a huge gender dimension and creates power in the hands of those who use violence in order to attain it, it's not going to work if you replicate that at huge expense. So huge expense of peacekeepers following a militarized model, doomed to failure, doomed to have to stay in those countries in perpetuity because you're not going to get peace. So what if, what if we thought it differently? Now, there's so much research that's been done that on the issue of gender equality, which when it's, in it's reduction in score was basically looking at women and men, is that we're not as sophisticated as we need to be, otherwise we wouldn't be talking gender equality, we're talking gender. But anyway, um, if we use the language gender equality, what we're really saying here is that we need to be paying attention to the political economy in communities so that the violence within those communities is undone by moving towards a reduction of the imbalances of power. The research done has shown quite categorically that when that happens, you have more peaceful societies. Well, if we know that, why aren't we giving it the necessary nutrition to make it work? We're talking basically social and economic rights. Why is it we're not looking at that from a gender perspective? And if you look at the, you know, the brilliant work of Jackie True and others who have looked at how political economy within the household is so distorted in terms of who owns the house, who owns the tools, who brings in the money, all the rest of it, the work is often done by the women, but the power is held by the male. And it starts there and it spreads then into the rest of the community up to and including who controls the physical power. Change that, you've got a much, more possibility, much greater possibility of breaching uh, peaceful communities. 
Now, you do that by looking at the bill of sale economy, as I mentioned, and ensuring that financing is given to those um, activities which will reduce those imbalances. And valuing social reproduction over and above what is valued now, which is militarized power, particularly in post-conflict or conflict or post-conflict, and territorial control, which is predominantly done by men against other men. And women get swept up in the middle, not to mention what happens to the LGBTQ community. Not mentioned. So if we actually put money into those who are real peacemakers by actually doing all the changes, doing the social reproduction, holding communities together, you would have fundamental change. And it would not cost in Bosnia 128 million a year, you know, 128 million to do militarized peacekeeping. And whoa, two million, three million at most to support women's organizations who are actually doing the work on the ground. And even that thistled out very quickly. So what if we did that in DLC? What if we had actually put the monies that were uh, available into building that community resilience to ensure that when you have like the Great Lakes Agreement, which had fantastic provision for the transition and the transform, what could have been a transformative piece fell apart, but because it wasn't really funded effectively, but in which reparations were looked at through the lens of social economic rights from a gender perspective. So women said what they wanted, what they needed and how it could be done. Now, had that happened, had it actually been pushed through with the right sort of support, maybe we wouldn't be looking at the DRC in the same way as we are looking at it now. It could have been an entirely different place. But those are little tokenistic things which are not then seen as being valuable because our vision, if you like, is skewed towards looking at a particular way of doing peace building. And it hasn't worked, it doesn't work, but we are still seem determined not to look from a different direction and think, oh, what if we did this then? And that's the direction of travel we really need to be pushing it in. We need to look at the economics of it. We need to look at the gender dynamics of it. We need to look at how violence is created and perpetrated and how gender relations are absolutely causal in all of that. And if we could actually have a model which is bottom up, not top down, not for the UN, not for other states to say, this is how you're going to do it. No, create it and then nurture it, support it, and then elevate. And once we've done all of that, we wouldn't need any men in uniform to be able to hold a peaceful community together. Absolutely not. Um, because, I mean, if you look at it in the, the, the way in which the immunity works, is that the peacekeepers in the military uniforms, um, who are the sent by the troop contributing countries, they have the UN star. And in Bosnia and other places, you actually have uh, the police task force, the, the police missions, which are staffed by police from other countries. Um, they, all have the, the, they all have the status of forces agreement will give the immunities to the troops themselves. Then everyone else has functional immunity um, through the UN. But functional immunity is read as being pretty much anything because you're there 24 hours a day, so you're 24 hours every day in country, therefore you are technically on duty. So even though we were making the case time and time again that going to a place where women have been trafficked to for the sole purpose of abuse by foreigners, that's not in your job description. That is not in your terms of reference. You are not covered. But try making that one out. It's, I mean, it's really, the protection within that is legion. And because it's very male dominated, there was, and I hate to say it, this culture of boys will be boys. And it comes from leadership at the top. You know, if you have an SRSG or someone in charge who just gives the wink that it's okay, we don't really care. And then the whole thing falls apart in terms. There's not enough understanding of how accountability works in a totally distorted atmosphere of power. The UN being an incredibly hierarchical structure and you know, self-preservation being one of them. You can't have, a, what would it be? Like a block of 
people from the UN, which you'd love to think they're all going to be the brightest, the best, the kindest, the most decent human beings on earth. But it, that's what I thought when I joined. Um, and it wasn't, and it wasn't. And I think that's the problem, that there are fantastic people in the UN trying their very level best to get things to be a more peaceful society and all the rest of it. But the model, the structures that we are that are forced into, that the people are forced into, means it's almost impossible for that to be achieved. Um, and I just don't think it can possibly be made to work. It's top down for one thing, and you can never impose a piece. You've got to grow it.